Um, I thought I would start uh, just with a little bit of the story of the genesis of this uh, panel, which was a conversation that David and I had um, where I asked him the question, um, you know, who has gotten this right? Where is this actually working? Uh, and I think there are several examples that we've already heard about, um, but David was telling me the, uh, the example of Maui in Hawaii, uh, where Kaiser, uh, which we heard about in the prior panel, um, is a purchaser of health. They're the health plan. Um, they deliver health care, and so they're responsible for health outcomes in that way. Uh, and then importantly, they are the major employer on the island. Uh, and so they really have that full spectrum of uh, being able to help produce health. Of course, the natural question, and some of you may know David recently moved to uh, New York City from San Francisco. So I said, well, how is this going to work in New York City? Um, and how is it going to work in a place like the Bronx? Um, how do we bring uh, the, uh, the infrastructure, the architecture, um, but do it in a way that um, takes into account the realities of um, the diverse, uh, the cultural diversity, the diverse organizations, uh, and the fact that there is no, you know, real analog to Kaiser uh, in the Bronx. So that hopefully is uh, is a nice frame, you know, for our uh, conversation, which is about cross-sector strategy. So how do we actually do that um, in? Uh, the mud and the muck of what it takes to organize um, in, in New York City. Uh, so um, without further ado, what I thought um, I'd do is just do uh, introductions as, as people um, give their opening remarks. Uh, so we'll spend uh, no more than five minutes, um, please, panelists, to talk about uh, you know, two uh, questions. The first is just give us a sense of your uh, background, your organization's background, um, and then the second is to take on this question of what is the most important uh, consideration with respect to augmenting uh, investment in place-based health um, with a particular lens of doing it in the Bronx. So um, we'll start with uh, Mr. Anthony Bug Levine. Sure, thanks so much. It's great to be here with uh, some old friends and people I've been cyber stalking. You guys have been ignoring me, but some of you are on the panel now. So. <laughs> It's really great to be here with you guys. And um, I just as, as an aside, it's kind of crazy on a Friday like that we're here, but I'm one of the people who you know would love to. This, this is where I want to be on a Friday evening, uh, talking about these issues. My organization, Nonprofit Finance Fund, we're actually 40 years old. Uh, we began in New York uh, doing what's now got a cool branding that Donnell will talk about: green retrofit financing. Uh, back when we got started, there were settlement houses being bankrupted by their heating oil bills who said to their donors, we need more money, and we were born out of this insight that you don't need more money, you, you can get a loan, put a new boiler in the basement that's more fuel efficient and actually saving your heating oil costs. Um, and that was both totally banal because it's obvious that you should get a loan and put a new boiler in your basement, it's gonna save you money. Uh, it was also revolutionary because it allowed the nonprofit organizations to think of themselves and their relationship with financing in a different way, and that's how we were born. We're now a national organization, we make loans, and in addition, um, we, provide what would technically be called capacity building services. We help nonprofits develop greater confidence and ability to manage finances, which has become centrally important in the, on the other side of the hospitals and the payers in this conversation. Uh, we started into this work from our clients. It was our borrowers and our clients in New York and elsewhere who run human services agencies who came to us and said, we've been hearing that we should be trying to work with hospital systems and health insurance because we create value for them. Should we? Should we go to the DISRUP meeting? Is that a distraction? Is that somewhere we can create value? And then we started getting calls from hospital systems and from insurance companies saying, you know, as we heard earlier, we know social determinants are going to drive our costs over the next decade. We don't know how to work with nonprofits. And we got a lot of different questions about how do you understand who could be your effective partner on the, on the social determinant side. So we've been drawn into this work. And I think we came into it very analytically. And I really want to follow up on Tyler's charge that he sort of ended the last panel with, which was, Let's stop talking around the core issue, which is we can't just do the same things we've been doing. And I think we approach this work in a very traditional way for the people in this room, which was through a technocratic approach of, well, we'll produce good analysis and we'll prove that it saves everyone money and we'll rely on a win-win and it'll sort of all work. Uh, and we've been now working across the country in lots of different formats, helping on both sides 
creating the conditions in which the providers of social terms and services, the human services agencies, the CBOs, can work effectively with the payers and the providers. And I've um, been doing that with a lot of support from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and others to, to pilot these different arrangements. Two things I'd say about that. Um, we've learned, if, and I really think about what do we now know that we didn't know when we began this work. Um, it's not just about the financial analysis. I think we came in thinking, well, we're mission-driven people. The hospitals and insurance companies will respond mostly to financial pressures. Therefore, we have to make the financial case in an analytical way. Um, and we have found that that's actually a tenuous way to build a partnership. We underestimated the extent to which partnerships need to be fueled on both sides by a common vision around mission. Uh, and that was something that I think has been really helpful because I think we were too defensive about, well, we've got to make this about the money. Um, you can get something going when it's around the money. You don't get people to work through the really difficult aspects when it's just about that. Um, but again, just to, to finish up for now on, on Tyler's charge, I think differently. I think the other really important point is we've heard a lot in this conversation around create a shared vision. We all agree it would be great if we could have fewer people in hospital and more people. It's better for the people. It's better for the hospital systems. Um, let's, you know, invest in certain services and so forth. But I think there's something fundamentally, there's something else that has gotten us in the situation we're in. It's, and that's the hoarding of power. Uh, it's not just about the money. Um, what we need if we're really going to create the conditions in which the Bronx and other communities can thrive is a system of funding that unleashes the potential that is already in those communities and that responds and places resources to those people in those communities who have the ability to understand and realize the aspirations of the people in those communities. We don't have a funding system that works that way. Right now, our funding system, in order for that to happen, you would have to have funding that allows for collaboration, long-term, and responsiveness, because that's what it's going to take to really unlock the potential in those communities. Whether it's on the investing side or the grant-making side, rather than being long-term, flexible, and promoting collaboration, we have a system that is short-term, restrictive, and competitive. So we have a fundamental system of how we make investments and how we make grants that is organized around what is best for the people with the money and not what is best for the people in the community. So I just love to the panel to get into the fact that there's a systemic level we have to address, an emotional level, and I think the analytical level is perhaps the easiest. But one of the frustrations we all have is why has all this analysis not led to massively more examples like the ones we heard earlier? Um, and I think it's because we're not addressing the other two levels. Thanks, Anthony, for raising those questions. We'll certainly uh, try to get into them uh, in our panel. Next is Mr. Donnell Baird, who serves as founder and CEO of Block Power. Well, it's always unfortunate to have to follow Anthony Bug Levine uh, and Tyler from the last panel, to be, to be frank. Um, uh, my name is Donnell Baird. I'm uh, the CEO of a tech startup called Block Power. We focus on clean energy in financially underserved communities. Our largest project is to, in, uh, to move about 1,000 apartment buildings in the Bronx uh, that burn oil uh, for heat and hot water, uh, which means they, they burn 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because they provide heat. So even when it's 90 degrees outside, you have a giant boiler in the basement that's burning oil to produce heat and hot water. Um, in 5,000 buildings across the Bronx. Um, so we're going to move 1,000 of those buildings to solar-powered, clean energy, electric heating systems. Um, we've negotiated a deal with um, two Japanese manufacturers um, who are going to help us train local construction companies to install these electric heating systems in 1,000 buildings. Um, all in, the project is uh, about $100 million in total economic value, which we're borrowing from Wall Street uh, to lend to building owners to, to upgrade their buildings. Um, the savings that are generated from, from s switching from burning oil, which is very expensive, to, to using solar to power your heating system are significant, and those savings are significant enough to cover the cost of the loan that each building takes on. So the project will pay for itself. And then in addition, um, the utility company has hired us to, um, on a pay for performance project, which if everything works out, um, um, they, they will kick in uh, a success payment um, because we're operating in a part of the Con Edison utility grid um, that's distressed. Um, 
in the Bronx. And so if we can solve this problem for Con Edison, there's economic value that's created for them so they kick in. What I've been interested in learning today is how um, the, the healthcare sector can participate in the project as well. Um, the Bronx, as you know, has the highest housing rates in the country. Um, we came across a data set of 700 apartment buildings in the Bronx that have higher than average chronic uh, emergency room visitations um, because the buildings are trapping outdoor air pollution or indoor air pollution from the oil that they're burning in their basement, recirculating that pollution across the building and everyone's breathing it in, having asthma attacks and going to the emergency room. And on one of our first projects in 2014, we unfortunately had a four-year-old uh, die after inhaling indoor air pollution in his school. Uh, the school hired us to figure out what happened. We put air quality sensors throughout the building and discovered that indeed the, the pollution from the highway was coming into the school through the energy system, being sucked in, uh, being deposited into the cafeteria, and every day after lunch, all the kids would start to have asthma attacks, which is why the school nurse had, you know, 70 different inhalers. Of Four-year-olds don't know which inhaler belongs to which kids, so every kid's name is taped to every inhaler. So that's how we discovered that that was a, a relationship between clean energy or dirty energy systems in the Bronx and healthcare. And um, there are a few insurance companies, and um, Monty Fiore has indicated some interest in figuring out how to reduce emergency room visitation rates as one of the beneficial outcomes of shifting these thousand buildings to clean energy. So um, that's, that's what we're working on, and that's how we find our way uh, into this conversation as part of this project. We recently completed, um, we uh, greened 500 apartment buildings in central Brooklyn, and were able to measure air quality reductions in about 100 of them and saw a significant reduction that we think correlates to, um, to, to, to beneficial health outcomes. And so we're working with MIT, um, and hopefully uh, Dr. Diane Hernandez is here from Columbia, who's one of the world's foremost experts on this stuff, um, to, 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 to kind of ensure that the, the delta the air pollution that's avoided in each building that we do in the Bronx can be presented to, to the local health um, care system uh, so that they can participate with Con Ed and provide an additional preventative health care payment. Thank you, Donnell. Um, next is Ms. Kimberly Latimer Nelligan, who serves as president of the Low Income Investment Fund. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, so I am with the Low Income Investment Fund, or LIF. We're a national CDFI, or Community Development Financial Institution. Um, our mission is poverty alleviation, which we all learned 10 or 15 years ago that really means uh, creating, improving health. Um, and so as such, we've been investing in the social determinants of health for about 35 years. Um, and this past summer, we issued the first S&P rated CDFI bond that had a formal sustainability designation at a face amount of 100. And I mention that only because it's really our work around social determinants of health that allowed us to obtain that sustainability designation, which we um, are pretty certain drove up investor interest, which um, drives down the cost we borrow at, that we can then pass on to the communities we serve. So uh, that's important. So as a CDFI, um, our primary tool is capital. Uh, and so as we think about um, improving health outcomes and how we use capital to do that, um, a few things. One, um, we are very much about leveraging capital. I agree that there's a lot of capital out there and we need to do a better job of making sure it gets into the right pockets. Um, but I also think it's incumbent upon us to uh, stretch it they're all uh, 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 very dear resources, constrained resources. And so as a CDFI, we take public subsidy, we take federal subsidy, uh, like Capital Magnet Fund or Healthy Food Initiative, uh, local subsidies for municipalities, and leverage them up, create a capital stack, bring in other financial institutions, bring in philanthropy, and in that way we can turn $1 of subsidy or grant dollars into $5 or $10 to put into communities. Uh, and so that's a role CDFIs play, and particularly in thinking about health and housing and investing 
um, in a cross-sector way. Um, I think that there's a lot of innovation that needs to be done, and, and that's a, a role CDFIs and LIFT plays. Um, uh, the other thing I want to comment on, and um, Julia mentioned this earlier, it's really about equity. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about SPARC, which is Strong, Prosperous, and Resilient Communities Challenge. Um, that is a program we do with our partners, um, Enterprise and NRDC, with a number of funders, RWJ being the lead funder. And it's really about community, vo community voice and community power. Um, so not just engaging the community, but having the table set by members of the community and having them determine how investments are made. And in the context of SPARC, it is about creating and improving a culture of health and thinking about climate, which goes hand in hand with health, and all of this through an equity lens. Uh, and in that way, um, and I think displacement was mentioned earlier, um, communities can create opportunities um, for themselves without, without displacement. Um, and it's innovations like that that I think are uh, critical. When you, um, I'll just share an anecdote, um, touring the Tenderloin in San Francisco where our headquarters is, um, if you walk around the Tenderloin, there is a lot of development going on, but not near as much displacement as is going on, say, down the street in the Mission. And if you ask, you learn that over a third of the assets in the Tenderloin are owned by, controlled by the community. So this notion of um, equity and community control, I think, is critical to, this, to, the, to the health question. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention around uh, innovation, uh, we talked earlier, there was a panel about community anchors. And this is very hard work. You're braiding a lot of uh, uh, funding streams together. Uh, and so we wanted to find a way to support community, the work of community anchors or community quarterbacks. Uh, and so we developed something with the support of the Chase Foundation called Equity with a Twist. And it basically uh, supports the notion that if you're doing comprehensive community development, you should be able to track uh, health outcomes and the population health of that neighborhood should be improving over 10 years. And so uh, we've developed a hybrid debt equity product, very flexible, long term. Um, and in exchange for that, the community anchor is uh, committed to certain health outcomes. So it's that kind of innovation uh, where we can show those results. Uh, where I think CDFIs can play, can play a role. Thank you very much, Kimberly. So with respect to community participation, we should acknowledge we are here in Manhattan uh, at a federal institution, uh, and we're talking about the Bronx. Um, so uh, I think that's, uh, that, that tees up uh, the comments of our next panelist very nicely, Ms. Marlene Cintron. Um, who serves as uh, the president of the Bronx Overall Economic Development Corporation. Um, you've been working in the Bronx for several years. Um, so uh, tell us how you know, some of these things are connected to the work of your group. I think more importantly, it's not that I work in the Bronx, but I live in the Bronx. Um, that is my block. I'm actually across the street from my office. so. Uh, BOEDC gets me coming and going. I have no excuse to be late and no excuse to leave early. Um, I'm going to share with you some of the good news and the bad news. Um, and I'm delighted um, to be here representing the Bronx and uh, thank Dr. Rosa Gill uh, for the opportunity um, to share our story. Um, you may have read a lot about the Bronx. You may have seen a lot of really bad movies about it. Um, I've got a lot of head sh <laughs> shaking, yes. Um, but certainly, things are improving. Um, New York State, uh, first the bad news. Uh, New York State has 62 counties, and the Bronx is number 62 in the area of health. We have the highest incidence of mortality, according to Feeding America. We are the hungriest borough. 16% uh, of uh, its residents are food insecure, and 100% of those are eligible for resources. Uh, so certainly, um, we have a lot of issues. Um, we have a really high incidence of asthma, diabetes. Um, it's just bad news all the way around. 
Um, at BOEDC, you would figure an economic development corporation um, should perhaps not be involved in health, um, but we have no other choice. Um, I indicated during a lunch um, that economic development really starts at conception. If you don't have a healthy mom, you won't have a healthy child who won't do well in school, who will not be a good employee um, because he or she cannot get you know, to work on time. The parents of that individual may not make it to work because the child is ill. So certainly, we have to think about health and economic development in the macro, and there's no going around that. So we very creatively created a fund, um, and you will quickly learn that we're not in this to make money, um, to kind of begin to reverse some of these issues. My companies in the Bronx, and understand that the Bronx is feast and famine. Why do I say that? We have an $11 billion business in Hunts Point. It's the food market, the meat market, and the produce market. $11 billion a year. And yet we have the largest food deserts in the city of New York. Does that make sense? No. And when we talk about uh, congestion pricing, that's not going to work in Hunts Point. We need those trucks to come in. We need them to go out, not necessarily to feed us, obviously, um, but certainly to provide food to Manhattan and maybe Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about you. So what we decided to do was to offer up up to $200,000 to our warehouses, our businesses, to put up solar panels. Um, it's a 10-year loan at 0%. We understood that our investment was lowering the carbon footprint of these companies. We also gave $13 million to a very large beer business in the Bronx to move, to convert their gas guzzling trucks into CNG. It was a great loan, but they paid us back too quickly. <laughs> um, but that was, that was cool. Um, certainly, they did the right thing. Um, and so we have been doing what we need to do. We, to the warehouses, we uh, also let them participate uh, to purchase electric forklifts. A lot of those are needed in Hunts Point. Um, we now have m kind of moved down to the smaller businesses. And if the equipment that you're going to buy for your business is Energy Star, we will finance it at 0% because we understand that every time we put out a loan in the street in the Bronx like that, our kids will benefit, their parents will benefit. That's on the loan side. Um, our tourism office does some other work. We've rebranded the borough. We have brought in many more jobs into the area. When I got there in 2010, the South Bronx's unemployment rate and this was a period of time where the nation had an economic development cold. The Bronx had pneumonia. All right. We were at 20.2% unemployment in the South Bronx. And so we needed to ensure that we created jobs. And we did that. And we have rebranded the borough. We went from warehouses that were selling their their footage at $12 a square foot. Um, it's now up to about $500. So a lot of companies are coming in, um, bringing more, more trucks, but we're insisting that they be electric vehicles. They're cooperating with us, but we've gotten many more jobs. That also impacts health. How? If mom and dad have a job, there's less fighting in the home, the kids are doing better in school, more than likely, there may be some sort of medical coverage. All those things are important to us. On the side of education, we have here, no pun intended, here to here. Um, with Abby Jo Siegel, uh, we have been working with, the, with Judy Diamond and Jamie Diamond and their foundation. Um, they had an educational program that tracked kids from middle school through high school, and we added the next component to it. I brought in a lot of the businesses in the Bronx that are lacking the kind of workforce 
that they need in order for them to continue to grow and expand. I want them to stay. I want them to hire more. And so we brought them in, and now we're doing internships, and we're actually talking about doing some other things. I think in a year, we went from maybe 50 or 60 to over 200. How many, Abby? Over 500 jobs. 400, 400 jobs by the second year. So we're, we're going in the right direction because we're not just reaching mom and dad now. Now we're providing soft skills for the high school students and, and encouraging them and teaching them that there are a lot of opportunities that nobody else explained to them that are available, not only in our community, but also within the confines of the city of New York. So I can go on and on and on. I will mention Amazon, last one, because we also have to think out of the box. When Amazon was looking for a home, I wanted Amazon in the Bronx. I'm sorry, I take it back, Fresh Direct. But I did want Amazon in the Bronx. <laughs> and guess what? We would not have had the issues, all right? We, they would have been welcome in the Bronx. But Fresh Direct had 4,000 jobs. They needed a home. We asked them to come to the Bronx. Uh, they came, they looked, they were skeptical, and I told them, you'll be back. A year later, they came back. We provided incentives. Um, we provided support. And only 600 of their 4,000 workers at that time were Bronx residents. And if you multiply that times four, you knew that it was 1,200, 1,200, 1,200, 2,400 people that would have been adversely impacted if they went to New Jersey. So I wanted to make sure that they had a home in the city of New York and especially in the Bronx. Because I knew that once they came here, well, over there, you know, what would happen is through attrition, we would get more jobs in the Bronx for Fresh Direct. And sure enough, that's exactly what has happened. But at that point, they were only servicing deliveries in Riverdale in the Bronx. And so this is when we have to communicate and collaborate. You want our help? We want you to recognize the fact that people like me, my next door neighbor, Joe Serrano, do not have access to Fresh Direct because you do not deliver in the South Bronx. And they said, okay, done. It, it happened that fast. He says, but you need to understand that there is a lot of people who do who cannot buy from us because they're on food stamps. Okay. Through our offices and the borough president, we reached out to the New York, to the U.S. Department of Commerce, and we asked them to create a pilot project so that food stamp recipients, homebound, elderly, single women with kids, the fact that we're in the middle of a food desert, would have access to better meats, fresher fruits and vegetables in their home delivered to them. And guess what? The plan went well. Everybody, and, and Fresh Direct was not the participant, it was Amazon. Amazon got paid for each and every delivery, and our residents got the kind of healthy food that they needed and deserved. And guess what happened after that? Nothing. <laughs> We're still waiting for this administration to make it a national model because it works for everyone. So that's something that we can do together. And I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Marlene. Mr. Gary Cunningham, uh, who serves as uh, president and CEO of Prosperity Now. Oh, thank you so much. And I'm, I am so pleased to be here talking about this intersection of health and wealth. Prosperity Now is an organization that is both a think tank because we do policy research, we work federally, we work at state level, we work at local level, uh, but we're also a do tank. We actually do a lot of different things because these issues of financial security are complex. You're not going to address with one thing. You have to do, it has to be a multifaceted solution. At the nexus, of what we find is that people that are, that have very little assets and a great swath of this country is in that position, meaning you can have income wealth, but then you have no assets 
and the money just goes right out the door and comes back and you end up staying very poor. And so what we've been doing for over the last 40 years is really developing uh, both demonstration projects and actually changing the policy landscape around how people think about wealth, how people think about ac access to financial services and products, and how now how do we think about this intersection that we're talking about of health and wealth. Uh, I, I just want to give it up for Marlene one more time. Could you give it up for her? Because she is on the ground doing this work. Uh, many of us can intellectualize about what needs to be done. It's the folks in community that actually know what needs to be done. Part of what I want to say here today and what is so important is that we do deep listening to the people that are going to be affected by what we think are good ideas. There is a lot of good ideas going on around this table uh, and a lot of uh, approaches that are technical in nature but are not adaptive in application. And so what does that mean? That means that in many cases, uh, uh, and I've been guilty of this myself, uh, I have a good idea and will come in and try to apply that idea, but it's not adaptive, meaning that the people in the community haven't bought into the ideas that I'm bringing to the table. Uh, and so therefore, without listening and hearing, and without valuing and having a value exchange in the relationship, you end up creating more problems than you actually solve. And I think many of us have been there. Uh, I used to run the largest health, uh, uh, FQHC health center in the state of Minnesota. It was the largest food shelf and the largest social service agency. And I had an uh, epiphany because partly what was happening is people would come to us uh, for health benefits, but they couldn't make their co-payments. And the co-payments weren't that much, but they were enough to tip somebody out of their current situation, uh, and they had no way to do it with dignity. And so what, how we, with the system we created, we'd have, they'd have to jump through 50 hoops in order to get their co-payments done so that they could get services from us. Uh, and we started, chase, we flipped the script, uh, but it, it took an epiphany, it took a moment of seeing somebody actually sitting at the counter, not embarrassed that they couldn't pay their payment, uh, to say that they are actually a whole human being and have a lot to offer. Uh, but we weren't looking at their value except in a monetary way. We created a program that really looked at what could you offer to the community in exchange for your co-payment so that that co-payment, so what, one, they could come out and, and uh, mop the floors or read to a child. or So they had value. And what we found was that change actually changed the ownership of those folks in their own health outcomes, but also made them come back with dignity into the relationship. Because people, no matter where they're at, they want to be treated with dignity. They want to be retreated at res respect. And so I just caution us as we do this work. So finally, I want to say that one of the things that we're doing at Prosperity Now is we are creating a health wealth network. And I want all of you to join. Uh, and you can go to prosperitynow.org and you can sign up because we need to build a movement. This can't just be a bunch of us sitting in the room talking about it. We really need a movement of people that are about how do we change the economic, social, and health conditions of low and moderate people in this country. Can you, will you join me in that? Yeah. Will you join me in that? All right, thank you. Thank you, Gary. Um, and uh, last but not least, Mr. Brian Bannon, uh, who serves as the Merrill and James Tisch Director at the New York Public Library. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm sure some of you are like, why is there a librarian sitting on this panel? <laughs> um, and I'll tell you why. Well, actually, you'll figure out why. Um, I want to take a, a little bit of a step back and kind of remind us um, about what, what public libraries really are. Um, it dates back to Benjamin Franklin, in fact, where 
he had a radical idea at the time that we needed public spaces that connected people to each other and to the leading ideas and information of the day to create a stronger, more democratic, safe um, and connected society. And it was through that sort of mindset, it was actually an economic mindset, that the public library concept that we all know of today was born. Um, so many of us think about public libraries as a, as a place around transaction of materials where you go and check out a great book and you go home. Um, but the reality of public library is that we really are rooted in that, that radical idea that Franklin had almost 300 years ago. Um, my career in library started um, actually at the Gates Foundation uh, back in Seattle where I worked all over the United States helping connect public libraries to internet almost 20 years ago with sort of that same principle in mind. What if we could connect a rural community in Arkansas to the internet and, and help that public library, help that, that person in that neighborhood connect to the world of ideas, uh, either to start their small business or to connect to health information or to connect to a family member. And it was through that early experience um, that I realized the incredible value um, and opportunity that we have through our public libraries across the United States. So from there, I went to work at Seattle Library, San Francisco. Most recently, I was the CEO of the libraries in Chicago, and I've only actually been in New York for three months. Um, <laughs> and so um, I'm just learning the city. Um, but one of the things that, I've, uh, that I wanted to say about the, the, the libraries um, uh, here in New York is that this value of how we leverage this unique institution is one that I think requires all of our creativity. That the public library system is one that we own um, as a society, um, and to give you a sense of its scale, there's more public libraries in the United States um, than there are Starbucks. There's more public libraries in the United States than there are McDonald's. Um, there are more public libraries in the United States, um, and people visit more public libraries in the United States than all the sporting events combined. And here in our own city of New York, if you think about the scale and reach of what our public libraries are, and keep in mind that mission of what we have, um, more people walk through our doors at the New York Public Library than all sporting events and actually all museums combined in the city. We're a huge, um, uh, you know, quiet, uh, people think of libraries as quiet, but we're a huge <laughs> institution um, that is serving a massive amount of people. Um, but it's all around this sort of this sort of this shared value around how we leverage sort of a very local community asset of a public library to bring community together, to learn together, to create community around ideas. And um, so, as I was preparing for for you know for for, for today, um, you know, in the, in the first few months on the job, I've been visiting as many libraries as, as I can. In at the New York Public Library, we have three library systems in New York. New York Public Library is the largest. We have 92 libraries, and I visited half in the first few months. So I'm making my way through. I've actually I spent my first tour in the Bronx, and I was actually in the Bronx yesterday, um, uh, giving a, a tour um, of our of one of our, our branch libraries to um, to one of our trustees. Um, and actually, in that branch library, I was reminded of some of the unique things that we're doing that may may catch you by surprise. Um, one is that um, you know one of the things that our librarians, uh, if you go talk with a, a branch librarian, is that the, they see a lot of kids after school. And this branch, this this branch that I was at at the Bronx. Um, yesterday had roughly 50 kids, uh, elementary and middle school kids, that were using the library after school. And there was a, a teacher circulate, circulating around helping them with their homework. And that program of just essentially a, a teacher and a, and a few other folks um, coming out and, and helping the kids with their homework came out of this, this sort of this question of like, hey, we got all these kids here after school um, for a variety of reasons. They're either not in an after school program or they don't have the, the structure at home or whatever it is. They need help with their homework maybe the public library could help out with that. So that's a, a program that we're doing in our neighborhood libraries, and we're hoping to scale that um, at, at, to a broader scale. Um, we have uh, the public libraries in our city, and certainly in the Bronx, and we're the largest provider of uh, internet access in the city. So you think about the public computers that we worked on 20 plus years ago uh, through the Gates Foundation, thinking we're gonna bridge a digital divide. Turns out, still roughly one in three New Yorkers doesn't have ready access to the internet from home. And the place they go is the New York Public Library. Um, and, and so when they come to use the computers, again, some of the programs that we ended up offering through our, our, to our libraries, um, again, was first getting people online, but then it's like, well, people are, why are people going online? Well, because they need to find a job, or because they need healthcare benefits, or because actually during you know, some of the biggest sort of transitions around our healthcare system, people are coming to the public library to figure out how to make sense of all these things. And so as a result, many of the programs that we've now implemented in our public libraries have been around um, helping people better access uh, healthcare information, uh, get benefits, programs to help uh, people find uh, employment or connecting them to the workforce ecosystem in their neighborhood or their community. Um, one of the other issues that's come up, we heard um, uh, Tyler was talking earlier about some of the challenges that we have in our communities and, um, and, and so what's working and what's not working. One of our, our, our librarians not too long ago was like, you know, we have a lot of folks who are coming and using the library that have mental health issues, that have issues that we're not really designed for in, in a branch library. And so. What, we, what our policy requires us to do is to send them back out on the street um, as opposed to getting them help. What if we think about that in a different way and bring in social workers, which is actually what we started to do, is, is bring in people who, who, are, who are 
who are, who are well equipped to help folks who are in crisis, who are in need, connect to the services that they need in their neighborhood and community. And in fact, we just launched yesterday a major th uh, initiative in Thrive called Thrive um, that is taking that, that concept even further in, in embedding a, a much better ecosystem of health information resources in our branch library. So um, I'm really here today primarily to learn. Um, I'm, I'm really curious about all the great sort of organizations that are working in and around the city. We're doing a lot of wonderful things in the Bronx from early childhood to um, after school programs for kids to workforce development to con technology connection. But I'm really, I, I think that our public libraries need your curiosity, that we need your, your energy, your sort of innovative ideas about how we together can leverage the unique um, infrastructure of the public libraries of our city, which we have 220 of them. They're literally in every neighborhood in the city. We may not have a grocery store, but guess what? We have a library. Um, and so how can we use those public libraries uh, in our city to really help drive a much more sophisticated public health strategy um, using sort of this new lens, which we frankly in the public library space haven't even really been er part of the conversation around healthy communities until very recently. And I was so thrilled that I was invited here by, by David, who's also brand new uh, to the city, um, <laughs> to, to join in the discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Your, your comments are, are so striking because they're a nice example of what several of the other panelists have also touched on, which is when we look at a community like the Bronx, it is easy to focus on what feels wrong. And we should have a, feel, uh, we should have a sense of urgency about it. 62 out of 62 in terms of health status with respect to counties in New York State, um, a full three years uh, under the average life expectancy in New York City. That's not 0.3, three years less than the rest of New York City. Um, and almost half of people who suffer from one or more chronic illnesses. But we have to look at the other side of the ledger, just as all of you have pointed out, um, and look at the assets uh, that also exist in the community. Um, one of the ways that I think about what you were talking about, Brian, is, is the idea of latent natural resources. You know, things that already exist in our communities at scale that just need to be looked at in a different way. Like the metaphor that I keep in mind is wind before windmills. You know, someone had the idea to change the way that we thought about it and was able to harness it in a different way. Um, so thank you for all of your comments. We have a little bit less than 20 minutes uh, left. It's after 5 p.m. on a Friday evening, so let's get into it. <laughs> Um, and I, I really want to sort of capture the time that we have uh, with some frank uh, conversation, you know, maybe some, some back and forth. So let me try to tee it up. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a primary care doctor. I take care of patients at, at Bellevue. And what I often think about is, uh, you know, for my patient who has diabetes and bipolar disorder and unstable housing, um, I'm the quarterback. You know, I'm the person who pulls all of those threads together. And it feels like we need those connectors, what are sometimes called backbones, you know, in communities. Um, so how can we do that in a place like the Bronx? So maybe I'll turn it to, um, to Marlene to start us off and then uh, open it up to the rest of the panelists. Um, I, I, I mentioned a lot of the, uh, the challenges, but certainly on the other side are our hospitals. And we have had amazing collaboration between our medical institutions. We talked about Feast of Famine. We have the unhealthiest borough, and we have more hospitals in the Bronx than in any other part of the city of New York, so go figure. Um, but certainly, I don't think it's the delivery of care but rather the needs, the overwhelming needs that there are within the community. So the collaborations have been very, very important to us. St. Barnabas right now is, do, is finishing up a study on those people who are, they're screening for people who are hungry. And they're creating a health wellness clinic in order to begin to directly address those needs. Uh, Bronx, well, Bronx Lebanon is a different story. Well, yeah, Bronx Lebanon is a different story. Uh, they called me just an hour and a half ago. We, um, we gave them $1.25 million and they're complaining because we're not quite sure we want to go take a picture with them. 
um, and brag about it. We're, the sense of urgency is so important that we just want to continue to do stuff. Um, but Montefiore, Montefiore has been a huge partner in the things that we've done. We've tried to make exercise sexy again. Um, we have the largest free cycling event in the state of New York. 10,000 people show up every October to do a 25 or a 40 mile tour of the Bronx. Kids and families and through the route, we have we give out granola bars and fruits and all that other good stuff, and then we finish it over at Bronx, at at Bronx Botanicals with some T-shirts and a concert, and I give out the T-shirts. So, <laughs> but certainly, we need to figure out how best to communicate and collaborate and support each other. I think mm -hmm. the reason why we're standing and our unemployment is no longer 20.2 percent, but rather five. It's because we have done things together and because our resources have been limited, we have learned how to make a dollar out of 15 cents. But if there's any spare change in this room, we'll take it. <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds like you're pointing up the role of anchor institutions, as we heard on the prior panel. But Anthony, this, this strikes me as something that also gets to what you're talking about in terms of forging common vision. So, um, so how do we do that? Yeah. Well, I think it's Question is who's the we? Um, and this has been said earlier in the panel, and I think Gary very you know, eloquently talked about uh, it's about reordering this, this, the system that determines how resources flow, that so resources flow to those people closest to both the challenges and the aspirations. It shouldn't be an intellectual exercise for the people in this room to come up and determine what the people of the Bronx aspirations are. Um, we should be creating a system that allows people in the Bronx with aspirations and with the credibility and I think crucially the stamina, because of their stake in their own community, it's unlocking their power. And the challenge is we've got a lot of money in this country, in this city. We heard earlier it's the richest city in the world. Uh, but it is, the money doesn't flow in a way that is organized in order to unlock that potential. Because on some fundamental level, we are hoarding power, people who have money. And so uh, I don't think we can have this conversation on money in a technical way. And about, you know, we do a lot of work at Nonprofit Finance Fund with amazing nonprofit organizations, including in the Bronx. Um, you know, there's a, a St. Arms, sorry, St. Anne's Corner for Harm Reduction in the South Bronx. They're part of, their answer to the question of how do we sort of mobilize some of the resources is let's join a citywide coalition that together can, can have the power to negotiate with the hospital systems and insurance companies because as a network of providers, they can deliver measurable improvements on, out, on outcomes. What's, what's really important about that network called EngageWell is they are led by organizations. A lot of the organizations in that network are people who come from the communities they're serving. They have lived expertise of the issues they're working on. And so it's about, but that doesn't just happen. Uh, it's a lot of work that, that takes to get those, community, those organizations to the point where they are able to tap into some of these resources flows. And I think on one hand, we talk a lot about the capacity building needs. If you're a hospital systems or insurance company out there and you want to see social determinants improvements, you know, you're going to, first you're going to say, well, which are the local nonprofit providers, the CBOs who I can work with? Then you're going to find they're all beyond capacity because we have made political choices in this country not to pay them the full cost of what it actually costs to deliver services. So none of them are going to be able to suddenly expand when you show up or have the operating reserves that allow them to take the risk to work with you. So that'll be one insight. Um, but then I think once we get to get over that, there's, it's, it's not just about the money, it's about power and trust. And a lot of the work we do, we find it's not just about the technical aspects of how do we create the right capacity on the CBO side and the insights on the hospital system side so that they can strike a deal. It's about how do you overcome the mutual distrust and skepticism on both sides. So again, I think we've heard a lot in this conversation around mutual vision. Um, you know, we find you've got to add in addition to mutual vision, mutual respect, and you can't address that unless you are comfortable talking about how we got into the situation we're in. There is a reason why the social safety net CBO providers of New York City are not paid enough money on city contracts to provide living wages to their workers, um, which means the workers now end up being homeless and part of, I mean, we literally work with homeless services agencies whose employees are homeless. That is a political choice we've made and we've made that political choice because that workforce is black and brown women. And I think we have to be able to have a conversation about what would have happened. Um, nothing to applaud about. But I think, 
you know, I don't want to scare people off who thought, oh, I'm at a hospital, I'm kind of corporate, and I thought I was going to find some great way to make deals. Like, do the deals. I mean, we know great organizations, leaders in the Bronx, who meet, who are those community quarterbacks. You don't need someone with a PhD to come in with a theory and be a quarterback. Um, I've got a friend named Reverend Ruben Austria. He's on 149th Street in the Bronx. He is a community quarterback. He doesn't think of himself that way. He's mm -hmm. a guy who lives a few blocks from where he works, and he does incredible work mobilizing the community, in his case, to help young people involved in the juvenile justice system. Um, and the funny thing I find when we talk to our clients about how do we help you get more resources because you're community-centered, they often say to us, we're not. There's three women at the church who you've never even heard of. They're the real people connected to the community. Mm -hmm. So I think we got to get even deeper. Um, and again, I think it's about the people in this room saying, let's get the deals done in the short term but let's do it with a commitment to recognizing that in the long term, we don't get what we need in the Bronx or elsewhere unless we fundamentally change the system so that it meets and resources the aspirations of people rather than restricts them. Thank you. Kimberly, did you, <laughs> Kimberly, did you wanna um, add to this thread? Uh, sure, yes. Yeah. So, um, and I wanna take it a little bit back to uh, something David has been talking about in terms of a population health business model. And uh, maybe I'm betraying my roots as a reform banker, but I, I like thinking in concrete terms of a business model. And I do think, um, and this point has been made, Anthony, by you, by Tyler, if, if, if we were one big uh, publicly traded corporation spending our health dollars, we'd probably all be fired. Uh, that's how, you know, that's how much sense this makes. Having said that, though, uh, turning to the Bronx, and you mentioned um, St. Barnabas, it is nice to shine a light on um, efforts that have been successful, way harder than they should be, um, but 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 still important. So, um, and and I'm highlighting this in terms of um, also the role CDFIs can play. Uh, so St. Barnabas, uh, 130 years I think as a safety net hospital uh, in the Bronx, um, in vision building an urban medical village. Um, on two parcels of land that it owned um, and um, building 311 units of affordable housing, 45 units for formerly homeless um, that are receiving supportive services from Bronx Works. Um, and wrapping, this, uh, wrapping wellness around this, um, there's an early childhood center, um, there's a healthy food cafe, uh, there's uh, ancillary services on site, fitness, teaching kitchen, rooftop farm, a very holistic approach um, to uh, treating chronic, uh, chronic illness. And uh, transaction, very complex, um, 13 capital sources, I'm sure I will miss some. Um, St. Barnabas contributed the land, uh, there was DISRIP funding, um, there was a NYSAFA tax exempt bond, um, there was a subordinate loan from, um, also from NYSAFRA, from their community investment fund. Um, there was Medicaid redesign team, supportive housing program dollars, a Wells Fargo construction loan, 4% um, tax credit, subs uh, subsidy from the city and the state. I apologize if I haven't named all the sources. <laughs> I only had 10 minutes, but, uh, uh, it, it, but really an incredible effort, and um, I think that uh, it's, a, it's, it's something that should be lifted up as a model. Um, and, and just a word on the CDFI role. So uh, St. Barnabas and l &M, the developer, uh, very important to pick high capacity developer partners. Um, lined up the dollars for the affordable housing, for much of the medical facility, but that really important community facility piece um, the fresh food, the pharmacy, the early care and education. Um, there really aren't great sources for that kind of cross-sector, cross-silo um, community facility financing. So as a CDFI, we had access to bond guarantee program money. That's out of the U.S. Treasury. It's something unique to CDFIs. And so we were able to provide a $9 million permanent loan to probably, you know, a small part of the capital stack, but a critical part. Um, and so I think that that's, that's important. And I would say you saw four CDFIs here today, New Jersey Community Capital and LISC and my friend Anthony at, at NFF. But as you're thinking about embarking on these developments, I would say 
uh, call us early because uh, we really, if that effort had failed because we couldn't have found that last $9 million, that would have been a, a big fail on all of our parts. Mm -hmm. um, so we're here to, to, to help and support. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, let me build on uh, one of the things that you said with respect to the population health business model and acknowledge that uh, we heard about the wrong pockets problem earlier as one of the fundamental challenges. Another one is um, time frames because the, the production of health as we're talking about it um, and its connection to some of the fundamental determinants occurs over decades and often you know, in the context of a family over generations. So how do we think about um, taking on time frames? And Gary, it strikes me that a lot of your work in terms of the connection between health and wealth because uh, the accumulation of wealth is often uh, you know, linked to historical inequities um, is something that is related to this problem of time frame. So how do you think about that? Thank you for the question. Uh, let me start with this. I, I, I have a uh, cousin that is actually a pediatric surgeon at Lincoln in the Bronx. And when I was coming here, I asked her, I said, well, I'm coming to speak about this health and wealth connection. Uh, and, uh, you know, you're working with people every day. And she said, she said to me, she said, Gary, I work with the babies. And I see the impact of people not having enough that comes out in all of these conditions for the, our littlest human beings. And that uh, if you're going to actually do anything to address these issues, you have to do it at scale. That, uh, that you know, uh, she's working 18 hours a day on shifts continuously uh, and could probably work uh, a 24 at least because there's just not enough medical providers in the system to service the folks that are there. So part of this has to be, and, and we've at Prosperity Now, uh, with the help of, of Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation and others, have actually been doing a lot of sampling of what works. And so we are being able to find evidence across the country, just like you talked about, and you talked about, of these things that are working, that people have come together in collaboration to try to address issues. What we're not seeing is how these things add up to the kind of change that we need to see in the world in order to address my cousin's problem in the Bronx. And so the question for us, there, there is actually enough in this country for all of us to live well and all of us to live with dignity. The real question is, is how are we allocating those resources? How are we building wealth in these communities? And so that's really what we need to be focused on is how do we get to scale with some of these issues? And I think the federal government, I think the corporate sector, I think the business sector, I think all of us actually have to come together mm -hmm on that front to, to solve these issues. And just to, to close us out, um, I'll ask Brian and Donnell to give us uh, brief statements about this question, which is, which is scale, which you both approach, uh, I would imagine, you know, from, um, from different ends, given the, the points of access that you described with respect to libraries across New York City. Um, and then Donnell, you know, how you think about it really as an entrepreneur um, and trying to, uh, to, to go from the ground up. So, um, brief statements to close us out. Oh, okay. Um, you know, I think that I'm going to kind of get to all of them really quickly is the, um, you know, the, the, the question of scale, I think, as it relates to, to us as a library is we, because we are in every neighborhood, um, uh, we have, we have the, the opportunity to engage with the entire community. And if you look at the numbers of people who visit our public libraries, even though we may not be on your radar, it's, it's a huge part of our population. Um, more than half of New Yorkers have visited their library this last year and using their libraries. Like, it's a huge number. I think the question we have is, who are the right folks for us to be working with to, um, to accelerate our impact in the key areas that can make our communities healthier? So uh, we know, uh, back to your question of longevity, about preparing children for school. 
Um, and so the libraries made huge investments in early childhood um, uh, development programs. It used to be called Storytime, still is, but actually it's an early childhood brain development program that's working with parents to really understand how their child's brain is developing, how speaking um, to their child, uh, talking about objects, stimulates their early childhood brain, brain development, helps them prepare for school. And there's a whole series of pr programmatic activities that public libraries are engaged with that can reach a level of scale in a city that, um, that we're already sort of invested in. The question is, how can we together leverage this unique footprint and access point that public libraries have deeply in their neighborhoods and use all the great sort of ideas and all the great other organizations to, to, to leverage that platform to bring scale to neighborhoods and communities where maybe not everybody has that sort of impact and scale. So that's how I think about it. Donnell, you have the last word. Um, yeah, I was trying to come up with something to say. So, um, <laughs> I was hoping you'd go for a bit longer. Um, <laughs> I, I want to go back to what uh, Tyler said on the last panel, uh, the, the kind of challenge he laid out, which I won't repeat because I'm not as eloquent as he is, and um, folks might take offense. I think there's a tremendous amount of waste in the Bronx. We are not borrowing $100 million to lend to people in the Bronx. It's not a grant, right? Wall Street has determined there is so much waste in the energy system, meaning people are currently overpaying for their energy to such a huge degree that by focusing on 500 buildings, we're going to recover over $100 million of dollars that are being wasted, right, to pay for fossil fuels, to be driven up to each building, pumped into the basement, burned, wasted, while they continue to make people sick and create even more waste as kids and parents go into the emergency room because they have asthma attacks that are being caused by the oil that's being burned in their basement. They miss school, they miss work, which causes even more waste because they get fired, they miss school, they're behind. So now we have to spend education dollars, we have to spend healthcare dollars. It's, the whole thing is just incredibly wasteful. So our venture capitalists expect us to go public and be a $20 billion company, just like any other venture capital investment. And it's because when you look at the data, there's so much economic waste in the health system and in the energy system in the Bronx that if you can provide a better set of services for healthcare, through preventative health mm -hmm. or through removing fossil fuel burning systems so that there is a reduction in the asthma rate and therefore the wasted healthcare dollars, um, there's enough capital there that you can get to scale. And so when you look at the Bronx, we're, we're also duplicating this project in Oakland and Milwaukee and Philadelphia. Data in smartphones is what allows us to do that. And you talked about quarterbacking uh, earlier and you talked about people going into the library to answer health court questions. So folks are going into the library, folks are going to their pediatrician. Folks should also be able to use their smartphone. Mm -hmm. So if we can collect enough data cheaply enough to provide them answers at the time of need so they don't have to walk to the library, they don't have to go to the pediatrician, they can come to you guys for other kinds of larger questions and concerns, we're gonna reduce a lot of that waste and that data um, allows us to build predictive models. So based on what's happening, what we've done in Brooklyn, we can make predictions around, around what we can do in the Bronx. We can use machine learning to make predictions around what's possible in Oakland and Philadelphia and Milwaukee and kind of drive um, the kinds of scale that you know, are associated with you know, Silicon Valley startups. So, so how do you take the kind of disruption that's coming from the tech sector mm -hmm. and apply that to the, the, to, the, to, the, to the very human problems and values and problems that we all care about and want to solve. And interrupting those vicious cycles that you're talking about really feels like the common thread across all of your work. So we're out of time. Please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists.